Here we are. We are on a Monday. This is new ground for us. We're trying to be a bit of ahead of the curve here because yesterday was the World Championships and what a world it was. Of course, this is the Race Communique. I am welcomed with my two co-hosts, Tom, Durbo. How are we, boys? Good, mate. I was going to say, I mean, this is the Communique, so we should be coming coming at it straight after the race. So uh, I feel like this is uh, this is what commissaires must do after the race, you know, sit down and uh, just make up a whole bunch of stuff at the end. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you we could have done it last night, but it was about 4 a.m. your time, Mitch, so it would have been actually quite comical to hear you ramble on about the worlds at 4 a.m., but um, no, early morning Monday, straight into it. Good to be on again, boys. I've been to races before where like at the Vuelta or whatever, where it's like, uh, have you guys got the race results yet? The communique, you know, kind of important. And like the chief commissaire says, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll finish dinner soon and then we'll get onto it. So I feel like we're in, we're in step. It's a little bit like that. It was a bit ridiculous. Look, I got the late call up for commentating uh, the World Championships at SBS. Look, I'm essentially the guy who got called into Slovenia for, you know, Mohoric who got called out. I got the late call up. I was stoked to get the call up. Another world championships in the bank. Um, That makes me five. I did from kilometer zero right through to the finish. I was right there. Mate, I did. I actually did. I did the opposite. I did the last worlds in Australia. I did it from here. Wollongong. Yeah, Wollongong. Started at midnight and finished at 6 a.m. in the studio. So that's another one for you. What are you up to? Uh, Are we seven now? There we go. Derbs, where are you? What you've, you've done two, have you? Junior Worlds, under-19s and under-23s. Well, to be fair, you guys have finished more than me. If you're talking about commentating to the end, you know. I've done a lot of World Championships, haven't finished a hell of a lot of them. So, uh, but, uh, I've started. Only finished in commentary, Derbs, so don't worry about it, mate. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, look, let's talk about this because we haven't actually introduced what this is. If it's the first time you're listening, this is the Race Communique. Of course, this is live from the Pels. I'm presented by MAP. We have been working with them all year, but the Race Communicate is exclusively being brought to you by the Escape Collective. And over at the Escape Collective right now, there is a really cool article that I want to discuss with you guys is the Gatcha's Eye popping numbers, 340 watts in zone two. How is this possible? This has been written by Alex Hunt. He's gone through what was discussed on Peter Attica's The Dive podcast that was released just a couple of weeks ago when he caught up with him at Montreal. A really interesting podcast. I haven't listened to it yet. I know Peter Attica. I've heard a couple of these things. I've been waiting to hear this. Now I'm definitely going to listen to this. I've just scrolled through the article before this podcast to catch up on what's going on. There's just been too much to catch up on. But more or less, what they're discussing is the Gacha rides at zone two at 150 heart rate. He sits at 340 watts and how he's able to do that Boys, have you scrolled through this? Have you unpacked how he's sort of done this? It's going to sort of allude to what he's done in the World Championships, really, this long-range attack. Yeah, I mean, I had a look at it, but uh, the biggest thing for me is that it's the weight. It's the weight that he has. He's, he's 66 kilos. I mean, when we used to do Zone 2, Mitch, we could do 340. That's pretty pretty standard Zone 2 for us. But still hard, but we're still we're packing We're maybe, you know, 10, 15 kilos more. So that's the thing. And you know, this guy is just this small. Who's 15 kilo more? Well, sometimes you were, maybe. In your in your prime, you were like 81 or something, were you? <laughs> um... I'm still not even 80. <laughs> I've been retired for three years. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I mean, there's nothing uh, revolutionary about time in zone two. But when you really break it down, he's talking about five hours. So he's talking about the entire ride in zone two, where you would often get, you know, your coach to prescribe you like 20-minute sections, 30-minute sections, do a couple of climbs in zone two. But he's talking about as soon as he clips in, he's doing zone two for five hours. And that just, that's insane. Because if you you think about riding at that watts, I don't know how many kJs or calories that is per hour, but like for a 1,000 calories an hour, you have to ride at like 276 watts. So he's doing like, 1200 1300 kilojoules per hour so the way he would train he must train with like a tuck shop of food in his back pocket to be able to to be able to handle that like there's the amount of food he has to consume to be able to get through that sort of training so yeah i think there's nothing revolutionary about the number but it's just like when he does it for four hours or five hours he's 66 kilos 
you know, he's at 140, 150 heart rates. So it's not even pinning him that much and he's doing it day after day. You know, he is a freak, but he's obviously he's putting in an insane amount of workload, probably more than I would know on the, in the world tour. Yeah, where's you even riding? What? Where are those rides? Like he'd be covering so much distance. I think he's training in, in and around Monaco. But I was just thinking maybe that's why he always trains in that group, you know, because he can just take food off them. So he's like, oh, hey, who wants to go for a ride today? Oh, yeah, awesome. Make sure you fill your pockets up. And he just takes food out of like Matthews's pocket or whatever, you know. That's why he goes in the group or Geraint or whoever. So I think that's the key to it. It's just having like a lot of people you can take a bit of food from, you know. Boys, we're going we're gonna to unpack the World Championships. This is what this whole podcast is dedicated to, and it was such a great Worlds. Like, I'm, I'm a fan of the Worlds, but typically they can be a bit of a snore fest until the end. It's a race of attrition, but this was just so, so good. The idea of this podcast is I'm going to run through what is going on in the race. Dervo is going to give us a bit of pillow chat, and Southern is going to tell us how the tactics worked. He's been speaking to everyone on the ground and understand that, unpack that. Should we run through the race, boys? Just to recap things, because there's just so much that happened. Even though I commentated the race, I still had to go back through the whole race to understand again what had happened. It was a 274K race, 4,500 metres of climbing, seven laps of the Zurich course. They went over the the Whittacombe climb, which wasn't overly tough. The Whittacombe climb was 1,900 metres, 800 metres at 6%, another 800 metres at 4%. 4%. There was another pinch at 86 So, look, it was an up and down sort of climb. It wasn't overly hard. The climb before that was the climb that was, was going to split everyone up. The Zurich Berg Strasse, which was steep, 8%, topping out at 15%. Look, I'm going to get into the race. That's a little bit out of the course. If you haven't seen the race, just go back and watch it. You know what I'm talking about. The attacks kicked off. It took a little while for the break to go. We saw... Six riders get away. Well, actually, in the beginning, it took 34K, at 240K to go. The break started to form with Sylvain Dillier from Switzerland. Look, Werdegen from Luxembourg, he was up there too. And we also had Pekala from Poland. He got up there. Three kilometers later, they were joined by Rui Oliveira and also Tobias Foss. They got across. 6K later, um, Simon Geschke jumped across with the Estonian rider and the Panama rider. Unfortunately, those boys played the ultimate role for Simon. They got piped straight away. They got on and they just got dagged straight away. So Simon was like, thank you very much, boys. See you later. They joined the group. Then there was a group of six out the front. Those guys I just spoke about. In that moment, Alice Philippe was involved in a crash. A few guys were involved in a crash. Michael Matthews also got pulled up by that. Alice Philippe then abandoned after that. With 207K to go, Slovenia started to ride on the front. It was clear what they wanted to do. They were there to ride for Pogacar, but they took it up straight away. We saw our mate up there, Luca Mezjek, Durbo. We happen to see Luca right in the front. It's not often that he's doing that, is it? Mate, he would be he would be so lost. He's the most efficient non-wind rider. He he gets wind burn as soon as he pops his head out of the death bubble he lives in. So I could just imagine him there just riding in the front, just going, what am I doing here? So, yeah, I'm, I'm actually racing with him uh, on Wednesday, so I'll be hopping into him about uh, all the wind burn he would have copped. I did notice at the finish he was there in a full track suit waiting with the, with, with all yeah. his – did you see that? Yeah. Also, you go on his go on his Instagram, and he's he's in the he's in the in the on the sidelines filming. You know, Pogacar coming across the line. You're like a fan. You know, <laughs> four laps to go filming him. <laughs> four. <laughs> yeah, four. 189k to go. They passed the finish line for the first time. They've got seven laps to go. Belgium got involved with the chase as well with Selenia. Um, and on the second lap, that was the fastest lap of the race. Belgium sort of tested the waters. It was really interesting. It was sort of like Denmark last year when they sort of lit it up in Glasgow. They went really early. They went really hard. And that was sort of it. The race had sort of been lit, lit up. Straight after that, 150k to go, we saw Australian Jay Vine launch off the front. I saw him and Chilty having a chat on the side of the Peloton. Jay Vine launched a massive attack. And there were some great riders that followed him. De Plus was up there, Tracknik as well. From Slovenia, Catania was up there, Magnus Court Nielsen, Sivakov was there, Stevie Williams. It was it was a rock star group that went across to that front group with Dillier. I don't know if you boys saw this. Dillier, I don't know what was going on here. I, you've got to tell me what happened. Dillier did the cyclocross bike change. Not once, but twice. Do we know what happened there? 
Did you see this? No, I didn't see the. He came no. through the feed zone first time, and I thought, okay, they've got no radio, so I don't know how he's communicated this, but he came in literally exactly the same as a cyclocross change, rolled his bike off to another mechanic, picked up his new bike, hopped on cyclocross style. Obviously, he's an ex cyclocross rider, so it was fine. I thought, oh, yeah, that was funny, whatever. Two laps later, does the exact same thing again. It was like he was getting his bike pressure wash and he needed it in again. It was so weird. Probably getting his race bike back, right? So there was an issue with it. He uh, gave it to him. They fixed it and he came back and took it back, I would assume. But I thought it had to come off the top of the car, though. I think it might be a world's thing, but like in a normal race, you have to change your bike from the car. So you can't drop a bike off by the side of the road. You're absolutely right, Durbo. You get a mm-hmm. big fine for it. So... But I've seen other guys do it. I remember a French kid doing it at the Junior Worlds in Falkenberg, weirdly enough. Um, and that was all over the internet. And perhaps because of the pits and stuff, they've got a slightly different regulation with the Worlds. I, I don't know because I never do the Worlds. So it seems a bit odd. It was, it was super odd. It was cool, though. It was quite cool to see. Just as look, at just those two groups finally got together with 105k to go. Back in the peloton, very surprisingly, it was game on. Slovenia with Novak started ripping it doing a peeler on the front on the Wickham climb. Casper Askreen attacked over the top. Kelderman followed him. Quinn Simmons, sort of, you know, those second-tier riders that you expect to go in that that next breakaway to start things up. What we did not expect was Primoz Roglic started ripping it straight over the top of Novak and straight over the top of him, the Gatcher decides this is the moment. At exactly 100k to go, he rides across to Simmons, Bagioli is in his wheel. He decides to just ride them completely out of the wheel. In the post- race interviews, you understand that this was not a plan, as it always is with the Gacha. This was instinct. And I love how easily he just rode them out of the wheel. These guys were just like fully doing everything they could. The Gacha's thinking, hmm, bit early. And he's just riding these guys out of the wheel. This is the best part about it. Instinctly, Jan Traknik, just remember, no radios, he drops back. He meets the Gacha, they go across together back to the breakaway because Jan Traknik was in the break. They come across. Now it's panic stations behind. Belgium put all their guys on the front. Herman starts. Campenards as well. Pogacar, he then moves through the break. He accelerates again on the next climb. Sivakov comes with a cross with him. He looks back, sees his teammate from UAE, waits for him, stays with him for a couple of laps. Behind, again, it's full panic zone. Wellens is now pulling. Bart Lemon from the Netherlands. Now Van Gils is pulling as well, who was a guy who was was supposedly a saved rider. He's pulling. Mm. It's 73K to go. Over the top of him, as Van Gils does an absolute peeler, Evnipol launches over the top. He has to. He's got no teammates left. Let's fast forward now. Two laps to go with 54K to go. Pogacar gets rid of Sivakov. He's solo now. He's going for it. It's all in. The chasing group behind. At about 39k to go, we're looking at Vanderpol, Molima, two from from the Netherlands, Remco from from Belgium. Obviously, we've got two from Spain, Adria and Mars. We've got two from um, France, Bardet, Godou. We've got Only there, O'Connor, Hershey, Simmons, and Vacek. There's just way, way, way too much to cover in these last two laps. Go back and watch it. I can't cover everything, but it's mano a mano. Pagacha's out the front, and there's just a tax on top of the tax. Guys are literally just doing Hail Marys on top of each other. Pogacar is fighting to hold the 30 to 40 second lead. This was the one of the best bits for me. Hershey launches this attack, one lap to go. It looks like he's actually going to get across. He blows it. He's rejoined one by one from those breaks. And once again, those guys continue to attack over the top of each other. In the end, Pogacar increases his gap almost out to 40 seconds with 4K to go, where he almost just is able to enjoy the last run in, the flat run in. Ben O'Connor, who who rode a really tactical astute race, clipped away and took a very credible second place. Matthew Vanderpool, he took third place in a bunch sprint. The the list, if you haven't seen it, Pogacar, O'Connor, Vanderpool, Tom Scoynes, Evnipol, Hershey, Ben Healy, your man, Tom, um, Enric Maas, Simmons, great ride by him, and Bardet, last worlds for him. So not a bad way to fly the flag. Look, a massive, massive wrap, but very, very quick considering so much that happened. Boys, let's get in. Let's add some things to this. Tom, I can see you're ready. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I found the most interesting about all of that and all that stuff that happened, Pogacar went 
And in five kilometers, he had 50 seconds. So when, when he joined up with Tratnik, it was between basically 100 k's to go into 95 to go. In that time, he got 50 seconds on the peloton. And then it never changed again. Like in a lot of races, Pogacar does when he goes early. He goes, Strada Bianchi was the same. He got like a minute and a half and it never changed. It never fluctuated behind. Never goes out to three minutes. Never goes out to four minutes. And this gap was small. And a lot of stuff happened behind. But you could see how... How hard it was, like like you say, when Hershey went, you think, oh yeah, he's just going to get there now. But like you, that, yeah. fifty seconds was just—it was a lifetime. You just could not close it. I mean, obviously, he, he, it looked it, it came down to thirty something on, on the last lap. But by then, I think like everyone was already been going so hard for so long that fifty seconds just gets blown up into a much. It feels like a much bigger gap. But the, I mean, the super interesting thing for me is just how he like he made that gap against. Bagioli, Simmons, like the, the second tier guys, right? With all due respect, not the guys he normally attacks into. You know, when you look at the guys on the road when he went, he punched the gap when it was those guys at the front of the bunch. And it's like, oh, don't worry, we, we're going to pull with, because Belgium had four or five riders in the group. Yeah, they had heaps there. The Plusi in the front. But it's those guys pulling against Pogacar and you're always going to lose. So he did the damage when he was up against the guys who... He, he could get time on. Like it wasn't yeah. like Remco was pulling himself immediately behind. And so waiting in that case was a, was a mistake on everyone's part. Pretty extraordinary. It's strange too, because in the moment, if you think about it, the speed that he attacked there, Remco could have followed that. It wasn't an all out attack. It was, it was an attack. Don't get me wrong. But you know, you got Simmons, you got Bagioli in his wheel. It wasn't a crazy attack that a guy like Remco's quality or Vanderpool couldn't have followed. And because it was so early, I think that's what threw them off. Yeah. And I think like, I think he started to really go when you see him go through the feed there, when uh, Bagioli's in his wheel and he rides Bagioli off the wheel. Um, that's when he like really starts to go into sort of put the afterburners on because he's already thought, oh shit, what am I going to do now? Just go for it, you know? But before that, like you said, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, he's gone, but it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't impossible or it didn't seem impossible. I mean, it would be impossible for me, but, <laughs> you know? Derbs, what were you thinking in this moment? Yeah, I was expecting Slovenia to maybe do more softening, like, and less, less like rapid launch, you know? Like, I mean, obviously they rode, but like, I was just, you know, I was expecting to do like sort of a Montreal um, style race and in montreal what they did they had like one guy ride and it was like pretty hard and they put novak on and then they increased a little bit more and then they put next strongest person on increased a little bit more and then just kept trying to wear the field down eventually pogacar went with two laps to go that's what i kind of i was expecting to happen but i mean i know they did a launch but it was very quick it was just like bang 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 then he's gone 100k to go you know it was just like oh and actually in the end like we lived, We literally, he was out for the front for that long. We witnessed a hunger flat and a come out of a hunger flat. Like, how incredible was that? Like, you saw him, like, he went so far to go that he actually, he bonked. Like, there's no question. There was a moment there that fucking Pogacar was nearly, nearly done. It was it was so incredible. Like, we were watching literally 40k to go, I think it was. It was, he was, he was nearly lights out. Got back to, like, 32 seconds and I'm thinking... He's, he's out. But all the calories he'd had on had eventually sort of gone into his system and started to come back out again. And then he'd actually ridden through a hunger flat, which was so impressive. It does go back to this zone two thing that he does. We talked about at the start of the show. He's low, low end of like his, when, he's fu- when he's fucked, more or less, is still such at a high level that even if he drops down to a level, he goes down to like second tier riders. So he's, you know, they can't actually catch him because he's already established a gap. But yeah, I just thought it was super interesting to see to see how opportunist he went. It was almost like if I go to 100k, Remco and and Vanderpol are just going to rely on their incredible workers. Like we're talking about incredible bike riders, Tour de France stage winners, and things like that. Like they sort of sat back and gone, oh, those boys will take care of that. But they needed to be like, it doesn't matter where Pogacar is in in that day. He might go 120k to go. He might go 20k to go. But I have to be on his wheel at all times and I don't think they gave that the respect what it needed to happen. I think also too, like there was a question of was it a good course to chase on and if we compare it to Glasgow last year, Glasgow was a horrible course to chase on and it was great to be out front. I would argue that this wasn't the best course to chase on but you could still rally the troops and he did essentially burn through two teams solo. 
They could mm. chase, and they were doing good peelers behind. You know, Kerman's did an amazing job. Yep. Campenhards from Belgium. Um, yeah, but it's, time, still, and, and, it's still Pogacar versus Hermans. And Hermans is like second at Liège, Baston Liège. Like he's a proper good bike rider. But like when you compare, like Pogacar's Pogacar. So he I know, did. But you've got to remember, Hermans is finishing his race in one lap. So there's a difference in effort. Pogacar's thinking of 100K. Hermans is thinking of, I've got to do 27K. Do you know what I mean? Like the mentality is different. And when you get to that quality of riding, mm, you would think that true. that guy could make I, more I, of a difference. I thought his term was too long. I thought he should have been. He he should have done less and even faster because I mean, it's easy to say in in hindsight, right? But like when I saw him pulling for as long as he did, even though it's the end of his race, it's it's still just not fast enough, you know. All, all he could do was hold it. Mm. He couldn't close, and they needed to close it. You can't leave him there and go. Oh, we'll close it in a bit. We'll just ride tempo with whoever. You need to like go. Okay, we need to close this immediately now, and make him go again. One of the big differences in speed that I noticed in talking about that was when he used Trapnik. Um, and tracking dropped mm. back, a strong rider, a credible rider, as we know. And his turn still wasn't fast enough just to get across that break. He decided to just lend a hand. He's like, just a sec, mate. Let me just pull a turn for you and we'll get across this breakaway. And Tracknick was just tapped out. So you could see then the difference in quality of riders, as we're talking about, the two different tiers of riders. And Pikachu is almost a tier above them. Yeah. There's also like, I thought it was a huge influence, like not so much on Pikachu, but like in general, when I watched the races, I said to someone the other day, on that course, like the motorbikes played a huge role, depending on where you were on those mm. narrow little sections on the downhills. Like it's the UCI's big event is the world's and they, they can't even sort the motorbikes out for that. And, and there's like loads of examples um, of, of where the bike was giving people like a few seconds to lead, like just on a downhill that just gave them enough. They could speed over like the next little ramp and little things like that over a race like that add up. And I think, uh, I mean, that's a, something the UCI needs to sort out. But You are right, Tom, because I reckon I saw that about th- probably four times, uh, even in just like the last 60K. Like they had an aerial shot and uh, was the group that was chasing Pog. And it was like the motorbike was literally out of the corner, completely paced them up to speed to get out of the way because they ran at the at such pace into the corner. And then there was that moment when Hershey was away and uh, Remco and uh, Vanderpol were trying to close it. And you could see that was on the back of the motorbike and Remco's just like yelling and his group's just getting, you know, bent over because he's in the wind. And then eventually they get there when the motorbike goes away. But like you said, just over those slight crests to build you up to speed or just to build you out of a corner, oh, that makes such a big difference, you know, to build you up to 60 k's an hour with like half the amount of effort. Yeah. Changing. All right, boys. Let's run through a few things then. We could discuss this race all night um, or night time for me, all day for you guys. Let's do a few things here. Right yeah, of we've the- got all day, mate. Let's keep going. You're <laughs> the one to get to bed. Right of the day, are we going straight up, Pog? I'm sort of going outside the bracket. Pogaccio for me, it was an incredible ride. But looking outside of that, should I go first then and take the best, the next best? No, I thought Tom Schoons. Tom Schoons rode yeah. amazingly. Yeah. I didn't expect him to be able to step up. There was a lot of talk about him being good here, um, you know, and I just didn't believe that he was going to ride as good as he did, as well as, you know, Ben Healy. But I'm not going to mention him as a rider of the day for me. I'm not going to take two. But I think Tom Schoons for me was he's got to walk away from that going, Wow, that was a huge, huge ride. Even the way he opened up in the the sprint as well. Like he's been in the break all the day. The other group was double, triple as big. Um, and even when they got across to Tom, Tom was covering moves. He was nearly he was nearly dropping Ben uh, Healy in anyway towards the end. And even his sprint, you know, like he's not renowned for his sprint, but he opened up and yeah, you know, <laughs> Vanderpol had to give it some beans to get over him. So he, he had a massive ride. Who you got, Derbs? Oh, well, I think I think I'm gonna have to throw the Ben O'Connor. You know, it was it sure. was incredible. Yeah. It actually was incredible. Like there was times where he got dropped. There was times where he came back. He rode super smart, and then just like just to think in that final, um, I think he was saying he wanted to go through the middle because you know when you look either side, they can follow you. So he, when he attacked, he tried to come through the middle of the bunch. So sort of was not expecting it. Um, and once he got that jump, he went for it. But yeah, just the whole day, I think, like the, the season he's had, um, it's been pretty impressive. And I think just to finish off like that, it was, yeah, it was mind-blowing actually. So yeah, Ben's my ride for the day for sure. 
Then you run across to Van der Poel and Evan der Poel. So, you know, that really hard yeah. section from the feed on the back of the course there, mm. which was like really difficult. That's where he made a move to get across to those two. And it, like, that's, that's Evan der Poel <laughs> and Van der Poel. It's like, when I saw that, I was like, wow, that guy's got some legs. And I mean, capping off a hell of a season, to be honest with you. All yeah, the stuff but- he's done. Yeah, and then to do that. That's exactly right. It's sort of capping out the end of the season. And it seemed right now, thinking about it in reflection, this is the way he needed to ride the Worlds and should have ridden the Worlds coming off this season. Solomon, who have you got? Outside of those two, um, I would just go with uh, Ben, just because he rides for EF Education, Easy Post. What about the nah. countryman, Only He had a bloody good day. He did. He did. He did have a very good day. But yeah, I was impressed by his ride. Yeah. Still Ben. He was still there. I mean, it's difficult, you know, to go out. Like, obviously, I watched the races with a bit of a, a biased opinion, but I thought that he, actually he, he was always making the right moves to get away from everyone else, to get himself in a position to get a medal um, or to go after Pogacar because he was always on the front foot, whereas a lot of other people were just sort of following into the thing, like mass, it's like follow into this, follow into this, follow into this, whereas Ben was making the race a bit more, in my opinion. And also you got to say with Ben that he's had like he's a championship rider. Like he's been proven now in the last, like to do the same sort of ride in the Olympic Games, to replicate that a couple of months later and do the same sort of ride in the World Championships. Like we're going to see Ben Healy on the podium at the World Championships or in Olympic Games in the future because as soon as he puts the national team jersey on, I mean, he's also a very good rider during the season as well. There's no question. But he's proven on like circuit races at world championships like two big big rides this year like he did the same ride in the olympic games as well it was massive and also then the world championships again so yeah that sort of caps it off to be consistent like that you can sort of have a day oh yeah good worlds but to have it like two in one year it's pretty good All right, guys. Um, Pello chat this week. Uh, it sort of goes with the World Championship theme as well. Uh, I wanted to talk about race radios quickly. The World Championships and the Olympic Games are the two races we do throughout the year that don't have radios, so they're quite unique. And you saw on you know yesterday with Pogacar just wanting to get that gap, wanting to get that fuel. Uh, he missed a bottle in the feed zone and he was screaming at the Shimano car to give him some information about what was going on. He needed his car up there. You know, it was a bit of a panic station. He had slowed right down to get a bottle. Um, there was a couple of times Ben O'Connor dropped back at probably bad times to try and put his hand up to get a car out there to get fuel. The race was on. And as we as just explained before, there was just these moments where you could just see guys like Tom Schoons was sharing a bottle with Ben Healy because they needed fuel, they needed each other. There was just like, it was a lot going on without the race radios. And look, it did make the race exciting and you can definitely see why people would encourage not to have radios because like the chaos is part of it. And what I wanted to say is that there's two, there's two races going on here. We're talking about circuit races at a world championships which is generally a safe and controlled environment. Yes, not, not racing is not safe, but there is like you go around the same circuit to finish and there's lots of commissaires, there's barricades, it's all set up. So anything goes wrong, you can change, you, you can let the riders know in some capacity, this corner, there might be a crash, something's happened up here, something happened up there. But then I want to use an example of Tour of Poland where they trialed no radios. Two guys in the team got radios. The issue that I see with this is that there was a crash. A rider went off the road and the two guys with radios didn't see this crash. And the commissaire has gone past and also the team hut car has gone past this rider who's crashed off the road. And it wasn't until the second car had got to this rider and realized that this rider had was actually passed out with a concussion. So, you know, I'm not saying there's these ideas about tactics and making riders think for themselves, and I, I totally agree. But the radio thing for me is a, is a safety thing, and there's these moments where you're like, oh yeah, riders need to think for themselves. And the World Championships, you see, it works without radios; it creates chaos. It does, but I think it only works in the World Championships on a circuit race that run by the UCI at the highest level. You know, we're talking about we go to a race in 
a small race in Tura Slovenia or something like that. Sometimes just things go wrong. You you need it. You need to have radio. So I just want to get your guys' opinion on when you watch the World Championships. You enjoy the non-radio, or would you like to see it in more races? Like, what, what do you guys think? I can quickly cut in. Um, I just, I, I think it really exactly what you said. You've already said this. It, it really added to the race. You know, Pikachu didn't know how far the gap was. They didn't know how far he was. They couldn't see him, and that's what kept that racing on. You know, I think behind that group that was chasing, always thought that he was within reach. Um, they didn't know, you know, 40 seconds, what is that? Is he blowing? It, it, it made the racing super exciting. One question I have out of that Poland scenario is, is it really happening like that? Are riders relaying back to the bunch, to their DSs, hey, you know, so-and-so just crashed off the side of the road. Is that is that the actual factor that's happening? I don't really remember that, that me relaying back to the, the DS that someone had crashed, that was the most important information. No, but if there was a crash, you would say there's none of us in it or so and so yeah. and so is on. And then you know pretty quickly. Hmm. Like, like for example, we had a crash on the weekend. I said, Dylan crash, Dylan crash on the left needs a bike, you know? So then the team car knows straight away on the left, Dylan's crashed. He can go and get a bike, rah, rah, you know? Like, that's something that would happen. I also think that, I, I mean, I don't know how, like, everybody uses their radios, but I feel like to start with, we probably, like, from the DS's side, we probably gave more because it was new and it's like oh we can but actually you still have to you know and i know this from talking to um one of the uae directors about pogacha right it's like riders still interpret the race they have like the way they need to and attack where they need to attack so whether pogacha had a radio in yesterday or not he he would still go when he wanted to go i think people think it has a, a more a bigger influence on the way the race is ridden than it does because if you know time gaps or if you know when the next beat on point's coming up, that doesn't, you know, yeah, okay, let's get on the front and pull, right? Or don't ride in this group, right? That's common. What you're doing there as a DS is if, if you've got a rider in a group with a group just behind him with another one of your riders, you can say don't pull, right? That's an overview of the race. That's common sense. N- nobody's sitting there in their car going, right, you do uh, 800 watts now, or you do this now, or you do that. It's like, yeah, it's a common misconception of what people think is happening. You like one most of the time the radios don't work. We can't actually communicate with each other because there's too much wind. So as soon as I say something, no one hears it anyway. The director may relay it or not yeah, if but you hear it or that's not. That's just completely debunking yeah. what your argument was. Then that doesn't even work for safety if you can't even hear it. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm just saying most of the time. But I'm not debunking the argument. I'm just saying that it's it's all. I just think it should be. We should just have radios, and I don't think we should be playing around with the ideas that we don't. We shouldn't because I don't think it's having as big an effect as people think. I think it's still there for a safety thing. And if they do work, then they are good for safety. So, yeah, like the director can always go, look, guys, there's been a massive crash. We're stopping the race. That happens in the Tour de France. happened last year. We're stopping the race, boys. Everyone stop. You have no radios. That's not happening. The car comes to the front. They stop everyone. Everyone doesn't know what's happening. We're trying to communicate. The rumor starts. Everyone's trying to pass the commissaire while we're all standing still late. It's absolutely chaos. Everyone should just get over it. We all race with radios. Every race has radios and just move on. That's the way I think about it. At the Olympics where Ben... So Ben and Ryan Mullen did a really similar move to Tratnik and Pogacar at the Olympics when Ryan was in the move. I spoke hmm. to Ben about that. It's like, how do you coordinate that without a radio? And he was like, it's complete luck. To start with... Um, Mullen wasn't supposed to be in the break. Um, this wasn't supposed to happen. And in the end, it just happened to look good on TV, you know? And so with or without radios, I think it's easy to, like, if there's no radios, everyone attributes the fact that, oh, it was a great race because there was no radios. But it's like, is it? I don't know. Uh, you're going to get sick of listening to someone talking in your ear, right? And I think probably scarred Mitch from just not wanting to hear people talking for five hours a day. And well, Mitch didn't even say if his teammates crashed or not. He clearly just said that just then. He he would just, oh, well, that's one less. I've got to fight for selection, I guess. He's down. I'm not. <laughs> the radio dangling outside the helmet strap. <laughs> <laughs> Team car went past. We'll pop that back in. Dangle it out. <laughs> what was the racing like before they had radios? What happened then? You didn't even have, like, honestly, I was trying to remember this. Cause I was trying to remember what team meetings were like back then. And it's basically like just this. Did kind you of... race without radios? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, in Europe. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it was like you kind of. That's right. Yeah, but... Look, I'm not. I'm not trying to go. We need to get rid of radios, but I think we can still do it without radios. Yeah, but the sports 
change. Like we didn't have team meetings. We didn't sit on the bus and say, right, this is our plan. We just kind of went, oh, somebody looked at the race book, went, oh, it's a bit flat. And then if you got towards the finish and you're just like, well, you know, this guy's fast. Let's try. And, you know, it's like when you were riding with Drapak in Asia. Like it, that's how the top level of racing was. And I think if you if you try and go backwards with the top level, mm. it makes no sense. I think that's the, that's the clear argument here is it's, it's changed so much. and It's just a different sport now and that it's evolved with radios and to take them out will make it sort of go in a way backwards. I mean, I think with the feeding yesterday, the thing that was more interesting than the radios with the feeding was the fact that it was two, only two fixed feed zones and they were both in a really crap place. So in a normal race, yeah. we can feed anywhere we want outside of the first 30 and the last 20, right? And that sometimes changes depending on whether it's hot or not. We can give bags wherever we want. There's no fixed feed zone since COVID, right? So now, basically, if, if you do Amstel Gold Race, every seven to eight Ks, you've got bead-ons with gels on. Whereas on that circuit, they had the feed was at the top of the climb where the biggest moves were going, where it was really hard and people couldn't get drinks there. And then the other one was on the flat before the finish. So I think a lot of the issues with feeding were coming just from there being two fixed feed zones instead of people being allowed to feed mm. at places that were actually suitable. Do you think like Poggy went out in the long range attack and then just realized that it wasn't Amstel Gold and he couldn't get a bottle every 7K and then he's just going like, oh, shit. That's why he's screaming for the car because he's like run out of fuel. He's missed every feed zone, you know? That would never happen in a world tour. I mean, how many feeds do you have by the side of the road at the tour? It's like a, a rider never comes to the car now. So to have only two per lap was like, it was actually limiting what people could do. Yeah, you'd have like on a race like that, you would have guys only just racing with one bottle because there was always a bottle coming soon enough. But like guys were like, sharing bottles because no one had got fuel you know and it's like yeah it was that was that's actually quite a good point actually the the nutrition side of things was quite comical with how hard the race had been you just see guys just like absolutely empty you know because they just weren't getting any fuel in yeah Righto, so talking tactics. I mean, I think the big thing to talk about is how um, how to beat Pogaccia, Um, which like I read a lot in the press before about people saying, oh, we need to make the race hard. You need to have multiple attacks. You need to do this and that. And I found it quite interesting that in the end, tactics-wise, he basically went beyond everyone's imagined tactics. So imagine if you're him and you've been reading all these tactics, like we're going to make it hard and difficult. And then before a single person, before Nielsen Paulus or Quinn Simmons or whoever has like tried to do this pre-race attack, because again, like I, sp I spoke with the GB team and they're like, you know, we want to we try and make it hard by sending someone good in a mid-race move, which they did with Stevie, right? So they actually played that well. But Gacha has just gone, all right, I'll see you and I'll raise you. I'll go first. <laughs> and so now everyone's going to be scratching their heads again because you kind of have to look at it as to... You're working on races where you, you're going to come up against Pogaccia, or, or I am, and you want to beat him. And you think, okay, what's the point where you need to get him where he's on his own? Okay, and how do you do that? It's normally about here, X. And now I've just watched the world and it's like, okay, I better move that like 40 kilometers earlier. Or to um, the neutral zone. He's going to go on the EV uh, now. The thing is, I, I sort of totally, I disagree with how to beat Pog. If that's the that's the question, the way to beat Pog is to make the race as easy as possible. He, you want a, as big a bunch left possible that's, because that's the he next may lose thing. a sprint. He literally the only way he lost Quebec, right? Which is like he probably wanted to go win back to back in Canada. And UAE tried to make it hard in Quebec, but the race itself was the headwind up the climb. It's not that hard, not that long the climb. UAE tried to rip it, but just couldn't make it hard enough just couldn't make it less than 50 guys that came into the finish. And Pogba lost because 50 guys were there. There was sprinters there, Matthews wins, boom. You know, but where Montreal was just, the race was so hard that he just got to eventually wear everyone down. As soon as you, you go, let's make the race hard early and isolate Pogba Char, Pogba Char's alone. Mm. No one's left. Mm. You're just going to make the race as easy as possible. Yeah. How do you make races easy? Make him, you, for example, you rate, you make the race, Pogba Char go 100k to go. Everyone stays calm, no one attacks, and everyone works. He would have come back because no, everyone attacked themselves. Well, the whole fine. the whole peloton works against Pagacha. Yeah. That's, that's how you beat him. Yeah, 
<laughs> but I'm just saying, if, say, if no, say if no one had attacked behind, right? There wasn't guys that I'm going to try and go after Papa Chap. Like, I'm not going to launch Remco. I'm not going to launch Vanderpoel. I'm not going to launch anyone. I'm just going to stay Dutch team, Belgium team, Danish team, stay together. No one attack. And you just keep riding for 100K. You catch Papa Chap 100%. Yeah, but that's never going to happen. We know that. I know. In theory, yes, that's a great idea. But as if the teams are going to be that coordinated and work together. You I asked how idea. to beat him. I gave you the answer. Fair enough. <laughs> I think what that proved is, firstly, like that's, you know, the idea of let's make the race harder and isolate him, exactly like Durbo said, is actually a fallacy that it doesn't, it doesn't beat him. But then, I mean, I also think looking at that race that that was the upper limit of what could be done, you know? Like eighty mm. k's at Strada Bianchi looked comfortable. That did not look didn't look good by the end. You know he like, I mean yeah, he won, but it it wasn't like smiling and winking at the camera and kind of like oh this is awesome. That was, it, I think the upper limit. So maybe get him to go with a hundred and three k's to go. Maybe that's <laughs> the thing. Tempt him into a hundred and three k attack. Do you, I don't know if you guys agree, but it was great to see sort of the limit of him and see him sort of struggling and what he looks like physically on the bike and you know to push him to his absolute limits you know to, and we saw that maybe once at the tour this year when um Jonas went over the top of him that day that he I don't know whether he bonked or whatever he did the, the stage that Jonas won um I was super surprised to see him struggling it was only a small moment but this we got to really witness the whole lap the whole one and a half last laps he was really just trying to work out like all of us, if we'd been in a breakaway, how to survive, which we don't often see from him. I think we are talking about as well, like, I think he's the greatest of all time. Like, honestly, I think like when you think you've got Merckx, right? But Merckx was racing against, you know, like a post-war generation of like a much tinier pool of athletes, right? Totally different. Nowadays, the sports, there's, there's a much bigger pool. It's much harder. There's much more to do. And he's winning like this. And yesterday, I like, was, like you said, like the limit of that. And it was... It's rare, but we do see him as a human every now and again, you know, um, like when he lost the tour and to, to get those things to combine to, to make it work to beat him, not easy. He has to be, basically beat himself, you know. Yeah, that's exactly it. It has to be his tactical error, you know, like I think he potentially would have, but the scary thing is, is that he's not stupid. He's learnt that today, that 90, or yesterday, that 97K is his limit. So he's probably going to not do that again which you, know, you kind of want him to make the mistake. It would have been, like, good to see him get caught maybe and then, like, shit, okay, maybe I went in a bit bullish. Next year I'm going to work it out. You know what I mean? Well, but he still won. If, if, if you watch what uh, Jan Christian tried in the under-23 race, it was basically like a – it was a similar sort of thing, but it didn't work out, you know? Because, I mean, he was absolutely motoring and he was flying away and it's like, oh, yeah, he's got this in the bag and then, you know, cracked and ended up fourth. So, Yeah. I reckon when, uh, was it Plappy, when he did his first big attack at the Nationals, he went away and he just was the same thing, like guns blazing, I'm going to win this, was out by two and a half minutes or something. Oh, yeah. And then just like completely parked it on the climb and we went past him. Then he went, then he worked it out and never did that again. He's won three in a row. So, you know, like it's sort of, you know, Pogacar, he's, uh, we, we're seeing him now. He's learned his lesson. He's not going to go 100k to go, but that means he's going to win the next three world championships, which is quite possible, actually. Rwanda's hilly, Montreal's hilly. Like, we might see Poggy. He's, he's not going to get the Aussie nationals, triple. though, is he, mate? <laughs> no, thank God. Not now that's over in Perth. Australia. He would have got it on the Ballarat oh, yeah. course, but uh, now he's not sure, going to get it. Sure, not the Perth course. It's too hot yeah. there for him. Do we do we have one takeaway each from this world before we move into the quiz? Boys, Southern, I'll start with you. Takeaway from this world's. Um, ooh, one takeaway from the world's. I mean, yeah, I don't know if it's really a takeaway, but it, it, it is. Yeah, let me just think. Um, I, I'll chime I just, in. I, I, yeah. I'll give you some time there, Tom. Mine is I've never been so excited to see who got second in a bike race before. You know, like I think that was probably this era of Pogacar. You really are, when he leaves the peloton, you really are like, I wonder who's who's the next best, and you're like, you know, when when I mean, I know Ben's Australian, you come across the line, but we, I was like so invested between that silver and bronze medal, right? And when the camera was on Poggy, I'm like, go back, 
go back and you know yeah. Poggy's putting his hands in the air and you're like I don't want to see that I know that's a given but I want to see who's going to get second and third you know that that's was probably my call. biggest takeaway from the world championship it's the same yeah it was the same like the Giro wasn't it like the race for the second yeah. of the Giro was was incredible that's my takeaway was I've said it a few times it was the best race I've ever seen I'm going to stand by that I just I absolutely loved watching the race for all those factors seeing Pogaccio still struggle to win it in a way seeing his upper limit Seeing stuff that just keeps blowing my mind all the time. Last year at, at Glasgow, it blew my mind a bit going, oh, why are they going so early? And then it was just again so early here. And then, yeah, the fight for second. It was just – and just the Hail Mary attacks, just people just going over the top of each other. The takeaway from that, if I can say, is the best race I've ever seen. And, yeah, the Peloton just – I'm loving where the Peloton is at the moment. Um, I'm loving not being in it. I'm loving watching it. I've got mine. I think I think I would say that my takeaway is that we've got like a worthy world champion. And that's always what I want mm. from the world. You know, it's like the world champion should be in some way the best, you know. Um, and there was a time back in like the 2000s when, you know, Roman Weinsteins or whoever would win and just like, ah, this guy in the rainbow jersey. But I feel like Pogacar being in the rainbow jersey, Van der Poel being in the rainbow jersey, we're getting at the worlds these days, we're getting like the best is the world mm. champion. And, that, and that's cool for the jersey. It's cool for the sport, and yeah, I, I would say that. Well, here we are, the community quiz, and we've gone a bit of a different angle today. It's the uh, World Championships edition, so we've gone one question each. I'm going to ask a question to Durbo and Sullen. Sullen's going to ask a question to me and Durbo, and Durbo's going to ask a question to Sullen and me. And then we should have a winner at the end. And if we don't, we'll work it out. So my question, boys, listen to the answers and then we'll hear your responses. The longest solo win at the World Championships is A, 2024, today, Pogaccio. B, 1995, Abraham Alano. 1968, Adroni Vittorio. Or 2019, Annemiek Van Vluten, A, B, C, or D. Longest solo win at the World Championships. I'm just going to guess it's C. C. Adroni Vittorio? Yeah. 1968. Durbo? Can I choose the same? Because I, I think I saw the stat yesterday. Poggy's second. You're both wrong. Oh, Van Vluten, then. It's Van Vluten. Do you remember? Okay, oh. for, for a winner out of this, does anyone remember how long she was away for solo? That was at Harrogate. No, I can't remember. 150 or something. I just guessed not because of the length of the race was a bit short, so I figured more than 100 Ks was... That would have been, like, proportion-wise, it would have been massive. 105. And how long was the total rate distance of the race? 130. Whoa, that's the equivalent of Pog basically going after 70k or something stupid. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. So, what have we got there? Dead heat. Yeah, all right. This might be a bit of a tricky one, but um, let's see if anybody gets it. 2002 World Championships, Mario Cipollini. Oh, Zolder. Career Love long it. dream, world champion, right? Flamboyant Cipollini. What did Cipollini do with the rainbow jersey that nobody else has done since? At the end, when he, on the podium? No, after the podium. So what, what, what did he do with the rainbow jersey that's basically, it was a little bit superstitious, but he, he, nobody else I've ever come across has ever done this. And it's very cool. Burnt it. Okay, you're going to say burnt it, Durbo? I guess it's already clean anyway. It's not like he never washed it. He didn't eat it. <laughs> he could, that guy. You never know. It's not the actual one he got given on the podium. It's like like his his world championship jersey. You know what I mean? Like That he raced in then the following year. Mm. Oh, um, actually, uh, yeah, don't know. So did he something with the bands? He changed him. It's something he didn't do. 
didn't put sponsors on it, jersey, or? He never wore the podium jersey. No, here we go. He never trained that entire winter oh. in rainbow jersey. The next time he put it on was the first time that he raced as world champion. So he never wore it in training. So he got he won yeah, the world. That's unheard of. On the podium all winter, he just trained in normal kit, and it's like the first time I'm going to wear this is when I'm actually the world champion on the start line of the race. Which what was, was what, what was that race? Mallorca Challenge round. GP Palmer. Costa de la Trusky. Was it actually that? <laughs> Could have been. It was early season race in Italy. I don't know what it was. I actually did a race with him when he was world champion um, that year. And he, so it was in Luca, and he started the race 12 kilometers. Like he was with his friends and he just joined in the race after 12K. <laughs> he was just there in his rainbow jersey with a bunch of mates, 12K down the road and just rolled in. And like nobody batted an eyelid. It's like, oh yeah, do what you want. Just having a cappuccino on the side of the road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can't be bothered to go to the team parking. All right, so this is this is it. Final question. No, no right answers, but this is entertaining nevertheless. All right. Now, in um, Qatar Worlds, Mitch, you were there, was a rider who nearly won the race in the final. It would have been, not saying there was not a deserving world championship winner, but I'd say in the last years, whoever won the world championships is like the world's best bike rider. So it was an interesting attack and it got caught with inside 1K. So I'm going to list off three names. You guys got to pick this rider who was going to be the world champion. Tom Laser. Southern. I'm guessing who didn't win the world championships. Is that right? Yeah, it's the rider who got caught inside the last K. Andre Chmiel. No, at Qatar Worlds. No. Qatar Worlds. I didn't hear that part. Um, I thought you've, you've been on commentating on all the worlds. You should have listened to my podcast. We talked about this on the podcast last week. Did you actually? Yeah. Yeah, Tom Leeser. <laughs> Tom Leeser. Hatchie and I <laughs> talked about this for about 20 minutes on the pod. Oh, well, that's why you're laughing. I didn't understand. I'm like, you're like oh, I can't believe you're going to bring this up. But I was like literally thinking about it just then. Like, oh, it's a deserving world champion. I'm not saying Tom Leeser wouldn't have been a deserving world champion, but it would have been quite random. First professional victory maybe was the world championships. You know? It was a scary moment when we thought that he was going to get it. I was like, oh, I, I'm nothing against Leeser. He was a nice guy. But I was like, oh, is he going to get it? Damn. Yeah, wow. yeah. It's a bit like, it's it's a bit like you like... winning the quiz, Mitch. Mitch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to win this, are you? Same thing's just happened. Damn. You're just literally the only one to get a point, and it's you, and you've won the quiz, and everyone's like, ah, oh, Mitch is the quiz world champion now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's, right. it's like the mixed relay. I'm the duchy of the quiz. I love it. Well, boys, we've been banging on long enough. I'll see you next month. Sounds good. See you, Thanks, fellas. Boys. See you, boys. See you. That iconic music in this episode was composed by none other than the legend Pete Shelley. Cheers, mate.